for sign there pointing in the wrong direction for Russia right now. I want to bring in Lieutenant General Mark Hurtling, a CNN military analyst who was the commanding general of Europe in the 7th Army. In general, U.S. defense officials estimate up to 10,000 Russian military deaths. That includes at least five Russian generals, according to Ukrainian officials. Plus, they have heavy equipment losses. There are morale issues, supply shortages, reports of frostbite among Russian troops. And now you have Ukrainian officials saying Ukrainian fighters are starting to take back territory. All this together, what does it tell you? Well, it tells me two things. I mean, I've been saying this from the very beginning. First of all, I'd say that the, the troops killed number that's been advertised by many, I think that's lowballing the figure. You also have many thousands who have deserted their equipment, who have walked off the field. So you're seeing a, a, a stalled Russian force. They cannot continue the offensive. It's been this way for over 10 days now. And what you're seeing is the Ukrainian forces, both their army and their territorials, conducting what's known as an active defense. They're still defending their cities, especially Kiev, but they are going out on uh, minimum offenses uh, in order to kill the Russian forces who are consolidated around those cities. And they are having great effects because their morale is much higher. Morale being a, a combination of faith in their leadership, faith in their training and their equipment, uh, the, uh, an understanding of what their true mission is, and the ability to do the things that they need to do. You don't have those same kind of morale issues within the Russian army. They don't know, they're, they're incompetent in terms of their training and their leadership primarily. I just want to underscore what you said. You believe this 10,000 Russian troop killed number is low ball. When you think about that, I mean, that is more than the U.S. loss in terms of our military personnel in both the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan over the course of, a, of you know, two decades. And here we are just a month into this invasion, and that's what we're talking about. I do want to play what we're hearing from a Ukrainian soldier today. Listen to what he said about the Russian forces. I could say that they have some problems with their tactic, with their strategy. I don't understand um, why they not so efficient as they could be. But yeah, they are professionals. And that is definitely. We know Russia has caused tremendous damage in Ukraine, but they are struggling to hang on to territory, especially when you are talking about Rapine and Makariv, so just a, a little northwest of Kiev. What do you see as the biggest issue or problem for Russia right now? Is it poor leadership? Is it a lack of preparation, a lack of motivation by the Russian forces? All of those things, plus you add into those supply issues. This has been the one point that I've made since the beginning of this campaign. They do not have enough forces, first of all, for all of their objectives, Anna. Remember, we were talking about 190,000 Russian forces surrounding Ukraine just a couple of weeks ago. Not all of those are fighters. Uh, in, a, in an army at any given time, less than half of the total force are fighters. The other half are the supporters. They don't seem to have a logistical plan. Their, their commanders are inept and are, have not done the things they needed to do to execute the kinds of things where you see all those arrows on the map board, each one of those is a different assault. And you've got to have a lot of force, an overwhelming force, in the attack against the defense. There are some theorists that say it's got to be a three to one advantage. From the very beginning, they did not have enough force to conduct those various attacks throughout a country. And if you circle the, uh, do a full moon or a half moon around the eastern part of Ukraine, that's 1,400 uh, miles from Chernev down to Crimea. So you're talking about a long distance requiring support, requiring command and control. Uh, each one of those areas requires a multiple troop uh, formation. And what I'm saying, having seen the Russians train and exercise, they have not prepared well for the kinds of things they're asking their soldiers to do. And the soldiers are not trained that well in the Russian army. They have a longer conscription period for the most part. They don't get to learn. They don't get to fire their tank rounds as much as a U.S. military force does. Their infantry tactics are very poor, and their junior level leaders aren't the kind of sergeants that we have in our army. Well, and as we pointed out earlier, a number of generals have apparently died in this fighting. So they don't have leadership to tell them what to do at this stage, at least in some of these cases. 
Um, let me switch for a moment and talk about U.S. forces because we're learning today the Pentagon provided the White House some options for potential additional U.S. troops to head to Eastern Europe already. We know the U.S. has repositioned about 15,000 military personnel in reaction to Russian aggression with a total of about 100,000 troops in Europe right now, according to a senior U.S. defense official. Does it make sense to you to send more U.S. troops to Europe? It does, and, I, and I'm smiling because when I was the commander there in 2011 and 2012, we were we set up a, a, an actual series of briefings for leadership in the United States to say this is what we needed for a re-emerging Russia. Uh, but because of the wars and because of other factors, they weren't given. Where Don Lemon was the other night in Nova Sela, Bulgaria, and another base in Kostanta, uh, Romania, those two bases were built. There are literally bases there already waiting for brigade, U.S. Army Brigade combat teams to fall into them. Poland has also said we will host U.S. soldiers. Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania have all said we would also like U.S. forces in our country. So these sizes that we're talking about, repositioning the forces that are already there, the two, the two U.S. combat brigades, the striker brigade and an and a, and a airborne brigade out of Italy, uh, it's easy to start seeing that those troops adding up but it's what more troops could they get. Right now, there are currently two other armor brigades of about 5,000 soldiers each already in Europe. Those are the rotational forces that uh, Barbara Starr was talking about. Yeah. It would be very easy to send more forces there uh, because there are stocks that they can draw from and just getting the soldiers on the ground. This does not surprise me at all, and in fact, it's a plan that the U.S. military has had on the books for about 10 years. General, I want to end with this because my heart is so heavy every time I think about and read about what's happening in Mariupol. And when you take a look at this just devastating video out of this city, Mariupol, as someone who has led troops and made decisions about who or what to attack, what's your reaction? What goes through your mind when you see this level of devastation? My emotional response, Anna, is just like yours. Any professional soldier would say this is criminal. Uh, because it is. And I can't understand from any point of view why the Russian military would be doing this. There is no purpose in this. There is no strategic, operational, or tactical object, uh, objective to doing this kind of things to a, to a thriving city. It's just murder on a large scale. And that's why I've been saying for a while, these are all war crimes. There is no tactical advantage of leveling a city like this displacing hundreds of thousands of people, women and children, old people, sick people. It's just, it's just unfathomable to me that any military force in the world would do something like that. And I, I can only say it's horrific and criminal, and Mr. Putin and his generals, by the way, should be punished for it. Lieutenant General Mark Hurtling, thank you very much.